we're going to take a quick look here at a model of the cerebellum. This has not yet been ported over to our new simulation system, so it's uh, still only available in the C++ or CMER version of Emergent. Um, and you can see that it has this very complicated ARM system here that uh, involves a kind of 3D environment with actual realistic muscle connection points shown in these cyan spheres. This was implemented by uh, Sergio Verdusco Flores. We have a paper published about this and at um, some point we'll get this ported over. But for the meantime, you can use this video to see the results you need for the explorations. So what's happening here is the arm, now you can see the arm better, starts out in an initial position and it's trying to reach for this target over here. And we've specified the target in kind of three-dimensional XYZ coordinates. And what you notice is that the arm kind of overshoots. It goes up as high as that black line that we've conveniently marked there for reference um, and then uh, kind of comes back. And that overshoot is the error that we're trying to correct with the cerebellar learning. And so you can see already that it's starting to learn. And if we look up here at this graph, this big purple burst here is the anticipatory firing of the cerebellar Purkinje cells that I'll show you in a second in our model um, are learning to anticipate that overshoot and driving a kind of counteracting motor command at that point in time that happens to to provide the right kind of forces to prevent that overshoot. So this is how it's actually working. It's really fun to be able to see it actually unfold in time. We've got all the different coordinates plotted here and so you can see it all, kind of all the psychometric information and you can see that the learning is very effective. It is getting much closer to a kind of direct efficient reach and this is you know, sort of a small case of a much larger problem that the cerebellum is solving of producing this kind of overall sensory motor targeted behavior. Okay, now we're going to peek under the hood and see the actual model running. You can see that the vast majority of the neurons in the model are these granule cells. They're responding to the sensory inputs reflecting the lengths of the muscles as that arm is moving, as we saw in the 3D model, it's coming directly from those. We have the, the lengths of the muscles and then the velocity, the rate of change of the muscle length over time. Those are two critical inputs from the kind of muscle side of things. It turns out in our motor system, we have um, spindle fibers, they're called, that measure the length and rate of change of these muscles as we're moving. And that provides critical information into our motor control system to know kind of what's actually happening. Then we also have this kind of motor plan that's being provided here in terms of the target length, what we want the system to end up in. And this is kind of the initial idea with this model, the simplifying idea that the motor command that's being specified specifies a kind of equilibrium point, a target for the overall arm position that we're trying to achieve. And it just kind of sets that and it moves in that direction. And then the details are shaped and tuned by the cerebellum but this kind of overall program is provided by the cortex. And that's a simplification. I think the cortex provides a little bit more kind of time varying, uh, more rich information, but uh, this is an easy way to get started with this model. And then over here on the side, we see hand velocity, hand position, and target position. So again, the targets are computed kind of uh, manually, but presumably that's what our motor system is learning to do, is kind of visualize where the arm should go, where the hand should go. And then that um, these are actual feedback from visually, again, determining where is my hand in three-dimensional space and how fast is it moving. And so these provide the input into the, the granule cell layer. And what we can see when we click on the individual neurons here is that each individual granule cell, as I click around here, is receiving a very sparse subset of input from all of these different signals. And that is critical for allowing each cell to be very sensitively tuned to a very specific configuration of the target program, the current lengths and velocities, etc. So this is what enables this kind of lookup table-like behavior of the system. 
each cell is kind of picking out a different random combination of possible states of the system and allowing this, the Purkinje cell layer to memorize uh, based on that pattern of activity. The other thing that we're doing is introducing a kind of a dramatic form of accommodation or actually self inhibition which turns off these cells after about 10 milliseconds of activity and that is what gives rise to this kind of rapidly moving pattern so as a cell gets active it act, it's, it's active for a short period of time and then it kind of turns off and that allows a new cell to come on and this gives the system a, a much finer grain temporal resolution so that as these patterns are unfolding over time you get a unique overall distributed pattern of activity in the granule cell layer telling you what state the overall system is in again in this very pattern separated high dimensional way like a support vector machine so these are all then providing the inputs into the granule cell i mean into the Purkinje cell and if we click on the Purkinje cells this is where you see this really dramatic kind of huge down projection this huge collapsing of this high dimensional space down into in our case just the low dimensional space of exactly the muscles that are driving the arm in this actual implemented arm and so uh, the two there are 12 different muscles operating in your arm primary muscles and and that's really the space in which the Purkinje cells are operating and then the last piece is this mysterious uh, inferior olivary signal and what you can see right there okay is this little kind of poop, flickering of activity in the inferior olive that is occurring when the system experiences that kind of overshoot and so um, in fact we can compute that directly and that's one of the nice things about this model in particular we can directly compute the inferior olivary signal from these uh, vectors, uh, the, the hand velocity and the, the muscle velocities and target lengths, once the system is actually overshooting, in other words, the error, the difference between where the current state is versus the target is increasing over time, that's when we know we've kind of overshot. For the initial part of the reach, we're always getting closer and closer to the target, it's always decreasing, and once it's decreasing, the system's like, that's fine. But it, the minute it starts to increase, that's when the olive kind of fires. And it fires for, in particular, uh, whenever that particular muscle starts to increase, kind of modulated by the extent to which the overall target is kind of, we're, we're moving away from the overall target. So that is a directly computable kind of function. It's probably a simplification of what the olive is actually doing, but it does allow the system to get a nice robust learning signal and then as we said the time travel property you can see it here causes these Purkinje cells if you look carefully we can kind of zoom in a bit and we can see that the Purkinje cells drop their activity levels just prior so this is kind of repeating trials going over and over again the same reach right there okay let's see if I can stop it um, that's causing uh, the, the inferior olivary signal that comes in later in time is actually right there is actually causing these Purkinje cells to decrease their synaptic connections from the pattern of granule cells that are active about a hundred milliseconds earlier in time and this is that hundred milliseconds earlier in time okay so this is the pattern that it's actually learned to decrease to based on the signal that will now come in later in time there. So this is the actual kind of error signal, the overshoot signal that comes in later in time. And here the Purkinje cells are not decreasing because their learning is again transferring their response to earlier in time. And another interesting quirk of this system is that the learning is largely kind of a decrease in synaptic weights instead of an increase, so LTD instead of LTP. And that is what's responsible for causing the cells to sort of drop out and become less active uh, at the critical moment. And this is also important because these uh, motor systems, as we'll see in the basal ganglia as well, tend to be disinhibitory in their overall function. And so the net effect of the Purkinje cells in their kind of normal state is to be inhibiting a signal, and then they kind of disinhibit that signal.
And so this burst of purple is essentially this disinhibitory burst that's sending now a positive signal as a, real, a result of disinhibiting uh, activity in the deep cerebellar nucleus. And um, so that's a very interesting property. It has a kind of multiplicative characteristic um, and may be important for that reason. Uh, we think about it as uh, gating in the basal ganglia context in the cerebellum. I guess you could call it the same thing. We're sort of modulating the motor program. It's not responsible for coming up with the overall mod motor program. And in this way, it kind of works like a conductor, right? So the conductor is kind of modulating the overall symphony, sort of giving it the overall rhythm, telling, emphasizing, okay, more here, less there. But the conductor doesn't have to know how to play the whole set of instruments, just kind of coordinating and, 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 and modulating everything. And that's similar to how the cerebellum functions. It's kind of that conductor giving the right kind of signals and an overall disinhibition modulation kind of way.